There we go. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Daniel is the editor in chief from Strong Towns. Um, and I am going to stop my slide share and turn that over to him. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, my name is Daniel Harrigus. Um, no worries about the pronunciation. I tell people it rhymes with asparagus. Um, <laughs> I am, this is not a presentation I necessarily um, expected to be giving. I'm very excited to give it. Um, I come at it from a bit of an unorthodox starting position. Um, and I think you all will see um, why as I develop this presentation, reparations is obviously far too huge and nuanced and, and important a topic for 40, 50 minutes. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer a particular maybe unorthodox angle on what that could look like, um, one way to approach the issue that might be able to get some political headway, um, and that comes out of the work that we do at Strong Towns. So um, I'll share my slides in a moment here. Um, Strong Towns, for those who are not familiar with us, um, we are a national, I guess international, we have members in Canada as well, but we're an international uh, media and advocacy organization that focuses on the financial sustainability and resilience of North America's towns and cities. So our starting point is the question of how do we build productive places that can financially support themselves over the long haul and that can maintain a quality of life and a level of service for residents um, over the long haul. And the way we waded into the reparations question was through some work we did looking at the historical development of Kansas City and its metropolitan area. So that is where I'm gonna start. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen here um, because we did a joint project with Urban3, which is an economic analysis and consulting firm out of North Carolina. Um, that was a deep dive into sort of all aspects of Kansas City's historical development trajectory and um, what that means for its municipal financial situation. Um, which seems like maybe an unusual place to start a conversation about reparations. Um, so this is a map of, of Kansas City. It's kind of turned sideways. North is actually on the right here. Um, and in black, you can see the city's boundaries as of 1910, which actually remained the same all the way up through 1946. Um, and in red, you see everything that has been developed since then. Um, this is a quintessentially American story of development. 1946, we use that year because the post-World War II era was a pivot point um, in which all over North America, virtually every city began to rapidly suburbanize. Um, in the case of Kansas City, this meant massive annexation, you know, a more than like quintupling of the city's land area um, in a very, very short amount of time. Um, rapid outward expansion beyond those initial boundaries driven by um, the advent of automobile commuting and commuter suburbs and freeways um, and a massive expansion of sort of the city's um, obligations as well. You look at just the road mileage, parking, anything like that. And that was, that was where the study began. Um, but you cannot talk about this process of suburbanization and the trajectory of development post-World War II without talking about what that meant for people in urban neighborhoods and specifically what that meant for people of color in urban neighborhoods. Um, this is the population of Kansas City within those 1946 borders. And you can see that although the city itself has grown slightly in the last 70 some years, the city has grown from about 450,000 to just under 500,000 people but the population within the historic footprint has fallen by about half. This is a massive hollowing out of the historic core of Kansas City. Um, this is a massive disinvestment in what was once the city. Um, and that has obviously not fallen equally on all of Kansas City's people. Um, what you had in the post-war era was you had neighborhoods sort of tagged by the planners, the business elite, the policy elite of the day as blighted and either systematically disinvested in or slated for outright demolition. This street in this photo doesn't exist anymore because it's now part of the downtown loop. Uh, the construction was, was nicknamed by residents Kansas City's Blitz as it occurred. 
um, because of the resemblance of the scale of the devastation to the London Blitz. Um, and of course, this process of urban renewal of destruction, you know, neighborhood clearing for freeways fell heaviest on Kansas City's east side. Um, this is a community parade on Vine Street, which was a thriving black business corridor all the way up into the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, notably in spite of systemic racism, in spite of huge levels of discrimination throughout society. Um, you had these neighborhoods that had managed to develop kind of their own parallel economies. You had services, you had, you had upward mobility, um, you had a really intact community. Um, in a history of race and redlining and development in Kansas City, there, there are quotes from residents at the time that give you a sense of what would have been there. You know, all the way up Vine, this, um, this woman says, there had been semi-economic centers for Black businesses, you know, from 12th Street to 25th Street on Vine. I remember Barker's Market, Johnson's Drug Store, a cab company and a bunch of stuff like that, and all the clientele was in walking distance. These were complete neighborhoods. Um, they were not without poverty, they were not without problems, but they were places where you could build a life and you could build some wealth and it was being built from within the community. Um, I, I pulled out this quote because it mentions 25th Street and Vine. And this is that area today. Um, the construction of the US 71 freeway alone displaced 10,000 people. Um, to facilitate the entry of suburban commuters into Kansas City. Massive, massive disinvestment. And that is inextricable from the story of suburban expansion and from the story of massive investment in the annexed parts of the city and of course also in the suburbs surrounding it. Completely inextricable. This was a systematic transfer of wealth into these new white flight areas, into new development on the outskirts and a systematic disinvestment in core urban neighborhoods, and especially neighborhoods occupied by people of color. Um, and so that is the basis for what I'm going to call not just a case for reparations, but specifically a local case for reparations, or you could say a case for local reparations. Um, I'm going to stop my slides for just a minute, and I'm going to talk about why, why local and why this, this angle, because I think that is important. Um, I became acquainted with the concept of reparations through much broader discussions about, of course, reparations for slavery. Um, and I feel like the assumption in most of those discussions is we are talking about federal policy um, because this was something that affected the entire nation because we need we need a mass reckoning. Um, I, I have no qualms with the moral case for nationwide reparations for the institution of slavery. Um, I'm gonna offer something a little different here. Um, I think that there is a case for localities not waiting for whatever mass movement, for whatever political sea change would make that a possibility at the federal level, would make that something that Congress is gonna act on. Um, localities don't have to wait for that reckoning. Localities can act now and reparations for redlining and the policies associated with redlining for the systematic disinvestment in black neighborhoods. Um, that's something where there is a really obvious nexus between the harm that was done, the scale at which it was done, local government and local institutions, um, and the scale of the potential remedies today. Um, there are things we can do to begin to make this right. It's not a full, moral balancing of the slates, if such a thing is even possible. It is some, it is a way to start to act. Um, and there is momentum for this kind of local action. There have been cities having these conversations. Um, Asheville, North Carolina made national news late in the summer of 2000 for um, talking about a local reparations program. This that That's kind of still it's still controversial there. It's still undergoing. A number of mayors have raised the issue around the country. Like this is something that has that has momentum and has legs. So it's important to devote some time to thinking about if we're going to take the idea of reparations for redlining seriously, what does that mean? What does that look like? How is it operationalized? Um, so 
I don't think I need to do a detailed thorough history of redlining with this crowd, but I will talk about um, essentially what we're dealing with here. Um, lots of people have seen these maps. Um, this was a map created by in the 1930s by the Homeowners Lending Corporation, which was a federal agency um, that worked to support mortgage lending during the Great Depression and promote home ownership and try to stabilize the, the housing sector during the Great Depression. Um, redlining is not limited to these maps, though these are the most famous. These maps sort of served as the template for how to redline. Um, they went on to be applied by the Federal Housing Administration, which systematically refused to insure mortgages for years in areas that were deemed risky or hazardous investments according to redlining maps. Those areas included overwhelmingly almost every single majority black neighborhood, um, in addition to many others, in addition to majority white neighborhoods. Um, but redlining was overwhelmingly <clears throat> implemented along racial lines. Um, and this was something that was done by lending institutions as well. The federal government provided the template but banks did it. And I should say that this hasn't ended. Banks still do it. There is abundant evidence that there are still enormous disparities in access to credit, um, to, to mortgage financing um, that fall along these same historical lines. Um, an interesting kind of side note, I became aware of some research very recently. Um, when the Hulk was developing these redlining maps in the 1930s, some initial drafts of the maps, this one is from Birmingham, Alabama, um, actually coded black neighborhoods as a fifth category. You can see them in gray here um, and did not code them as red, which was considered the most hazardous for investment. Um, and in fact, Hulk heard from many of its local informants, the people that they surveyed to find out, okay, where are the where are the neighborhoods that we should say it's safe to invest in here and where are the neighborhoods we should say are declining all. There was by no means a consensus that as a pure financial consideration, that non-white neighborhoods were hazardous investments, were not places that you should, should lend for a mortgage on a purely financial level. In fact, quite to the contrary, um, a lot of lenders locally considered black neighborhoods to be good investments. These were places that had um, thriving business communities that had upward momentum. Um, so although redlining on its face was not, you, you know, it, it, it's not in every case an explicitly racial policy. It's supposedly a policy about financial prudence and, you know, where, where can we lend for a mortgage and, and ensure that we're going to get our investment back from a bank's perspective. But in practice, it was explicitly racial. In practice, a whole bunch of insights like this were overridden and the result was that overwhelmingly neighborhoods that were predominantly black, neighborhoods that were predominantly any sort of people of color were redlined. They were considered in that most hazardous group, which meant that you could not, in effect, take out a loan for a mortgage in those neighborhoods. Um, and we can see the lines really clearly. This is a map from the 2010 census of racial demographics in Kansas City um, from the now discontinued racial dot map. Um, and you can see the red, the red line down the middle here corresponds to the parallel of Troost Avenue, which is the really, really stark dividing line in Kansas City. Um, a lot of cities have an equivalent to this. In St. Louis, you've got the Del Mar divide, which runs more east-west. Um, if you look at this back and forth with the redlining map, you can see an overwhelming connection between the areas that are predominantly white today and the areas that the 1930s redlining maps considered first and second grade investments, considered safe places for a bank to give you a mortgage. Um, if you were a homeowner in a redlined area, think about what that meant for you. You effectively couldn't sell your house except to anyone who was going to pay cash. So homeownership declines. You have investors, you have slumlord types essentially ending up owning the property in these neighborhoods because they're the ones who are, who are going to come in and not need a mortgage. Um, if you want to borrow against your home to make improvements, um, to make renovations, it's hard to do that. Um, this was a systematic policy of shutting off the spigot of capital to these neighborhoods and thereby shutting off any ability for them to incrementally develop and become wealthier. Systematic denial of credit. And the fallout of that is clear as day decades later. Um, Urban 3 did this analysis 
of Kansas City, where if you break the city up by the four redlining categories from A to D, and you look at the, the land value per acre, so sort of the intensity of financial productivity of what's going on in this land, you can see almost like a tenfold difference, actually more than a tenfold difference when I look at the numbers between the class A areas and the class D areas. Um, I want to make a point here, which is that it is not just the people who were the direct victims of redlining who are paying here. The whole city is paying for this. This is wasted potential. This is lost value. This is a city that should be far more prosperous than it is, if not for policies that artificially held back the development of a huge swath of its land area based on racism. And the fallout, of course, for individuals is ever present today. It's present in the, the wealth gap between blacks and whites. Um, this data from the St. Louis Fed suggests that the average household net worth for a white household is over four times that of a black household. I have seen other estimates that have it at more than 10 times. That is overwhelmingly driven by home ownership. Um, household wealth is by far the, the primary component of most households' net worth. Um, these data are from St. Louis. You can see home ownership, huge disparities in the rate of home ownership uh, between white and black households, but also in home value among those who do own their homes. Black households tend to own homes in areas that were subject to redlining, and those homes have appreciated less in value. And that means less optionality in terms of other ways you can invest in yourself, um, improve your circumstances, and less ability to pass generational wealth on through the family. So this is not ancient history. This is something that reverberates in a million ways today. And for the city, we have that massive loss of potential. We have a huge area of Kansas City's land that is stunted, that is disinvested, that is underdeveloped. Um, and you can see the same thing in St. Louis. You can see the same thing in smaller cities. This is just where we have the case study, but this is a near universal pattern. So the moral case for reparations for redlining is ironclad, but so is the financial case. This is something that will benefit cities that have held themselves back through this policy. This, this, this is something that will <clears throat> ultimately lift up these places. And that is where the political possibility lies um, to really move forward on these issues and to build a different kind of coalition than I think is possible on other sort of axes of the reparations question where the moral calculus is at least as stark, but where the political calculus might feel a little more zero sum to people. This is an opportunity. Reparations are an opportunity at the local level to take neighborhoods from systematic deliberate disinvestment to systematic deliberate reinvestment. And the mechanism I'm gonna propose for doing that is in short, um, deliberately promoting in a targeted way, incremental development in these neighborhoods. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, by incremental development, I mean physical, you know, real estate development that is Iterating on the existing fabric of a place, not seeking to come in and wipe the slate clean and replace it. Um, incremental development is done by generally small scale operators, individuals, people in the building trades, people who tend to live in the area where they're working. And it can be anything from renovating a home, putting an addition on it, turning it into a duplex, building an accessory cottage behind it, um, to small scale infill that fits into the fabric both the physical fabric and the social fabric of a place as it already exists. Incremental development was the way that every North American city developed up until the suburban era, up until that pivot point of around World War II. Um, it was how countless frontier towns went from rows of shacks in the wilderness to someplace a little livelier, wealthier, more permanent, gradually, replacing the existing structures, improving the existing structures and the public infrastructure um, to little by little build places that were 
real concentrations of wealth and quality of life. Um, and incremental development was how the thriving, you know, for what they were, for, for the thriving Black neighborhoods in countless American cities, that, that was how they were built. So that by the 1920s and 30s, you had Black Wall Street type areas. And the, there's the famous Black Wall Street in Tulsa before it was uh, violently destroyed by a white mob in the 1920s. By the 30s, we had refined um, our method of doing that to something that was less overtly violent and more bureaucratically violent, of course. That's what the invention of redlining is in the scope of that history. Um, but what we were destroying was places that had incrementally built wealth and built prosperity and built density and activity over decades. That was the history of these places. That's what we need to try to recover because that's what we, that's what we undid. That's what we short-circuited. Um, pardon me for a second. I'm just keeping an eye on my time here. Um, there are lots of ways you could approach the question of reparations. And I'm not here to tell you that this is the way, um, certainly not in terms of a moral calculus. Um, it is a way, and it's the way that that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so why why development? Why not investing in other aspects of people's quality of life and their basic needs, education? Why not promoting home ownership? Um, my answer to this, if you look at the specific harm that was done through redlining, through urban renewal, through freeway building, through the systematic disinvestment and hollowing out of these places, there's a proportionality there, or there's a um, development is the mirror image of what was done. We redress the systematic disinvestment. Um, development as a strategy for reinvesting in these communities recognizes the importance of place, um, that you do need to invest in people. Of course you do, and you need to think about who is gonna benefit from every investment that you make but also that these places are meaningful, that they have long histories, that communities are rooted there, and that for many, many reasons, you know, Kansas City needs the East Side in the long run to be successful for Kansas City to be successful. St. Louis needs the North Side to be successful. Um, these places we cannot walk away from. We can't afford to do that. Um, they represent a development pattern that was productive, that was viable, um, they represent an alternative to endless suburban expansion, mounting infrastructure liabilities, sort of this rat race of, can we build the next freeway so people can live farther and farther out that is bankrupting all of us? Um, we cannot walk away from these places. Um, we need to invest in place and we need to invest in communities in place. Um, and we need to launch virtuous cycles of wealth creation with these investments. That's how you get a multiplier effect on the public dollars that you're spending. Why specifically incremental development? Um, development does not have a great reputation in a lot of communities of color and for very good reason. Um, it tends to take the form of what Jane Jacobs called cataclysmic money. Um, it tends to be something that is undertaken by deep pocketed outside actors. Um, it's not initiated from within the community and it tends to outright replace the fabric of the community. Um, you know, through the form of gentrification, through the form of transformative large-scale redevelopment. Incremental development is a different model. It is fundamentally bottom-up um, and it's cultivative, not extractive, because fundamentally we are talking about building in a way that is consistent with the fabric of what's already there um, and done by small-scale actors. The model, the nature of incremental development is that you don't get the scale economies you get when you were a huge scale builder that's doing giant subdivisions or giant block-sized apartment buildings. The way you make your money as an incremental developer is by intimately knowing the neighborhood, knowing the opportunities that exist that you can't see from 30,000 feet. Incremental developers tend to live in the neighborhood where they work. You almost have to, to be able to do it. Um, and so this is an essential strategy to ensure that the benefits of reinvestment in these neighborhoods accrue to the people who live there, to the communities that are rooted there. Um, and you know, who benefits is a more complex question than I really have time for here. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But the goal here is certainly not to develop these neighborhoods and just say, well, we got more tax value coming out of these blocks. So everything is hunky-dory. It's to avoid displacement and to make sure that 
the cycles of wealth creation that we are launching are rooted within the community that was harmed. Because we recognize, um, and this is a key theme of our work at Strong Towns that I don't have time to fully delve into today, but we recognize that places are more productive, more resilient, more successful in the long run when they are built by many hands and not few. Um, if you look at the, the apartment building on the right here in this sketch versus the block on the left, I think it's very clear which one allows more people to participate in the wealth creation that is happening. I think it's very clear which one allows, which, which one, you know, is it more likely that the owners of these buildings live in the area and are embedded in that community? Um, one more kind of theoretical point here. One source of pushback we've gotten to this whole kind of line of inquiry is this doesn't sound like a reparations agenda anymore. This just sounds like a real estate investment agenda. This just sounds like a proposal for development. How is this reparations? Where is the, where is the balancing of the scales? Where is the transfer um, from the group that benefited to the group that was harmed? Um, I'm drawing in my thinking on this on um, a school of thought called targeted universalism um, that originates with John Powell, who is a scholar out of UC Berkeley. Um, Sarah, I think that's the one link I didn't give you when you asked me to give you links for the chat, but it's on this slide, um, the Institute for Othering and Belonging at Berkeley. Um, the idea of targeted universalism is it's sort of a refinement of traditional equity approaches to public policy, um, whereas an equity lens might focus on the gap between an advantaged group and a disadvantaged group, and how are we going to close that gap? Targeted universalism focuses on a universal goal that is applicable to every group. This is what everyone should have. And then the targeted part is that we need different strategies to move different groups toward that goal, depending on their, their situatedness, um, depending on their history. So the universal goal in this case is we want a city that is resilient, that can pay its bills, in which um, you know, many people feel a sense of ownership, many people literally have ownership. Um, the wealth creation in that city is distributed rather than channeled upward to a remote kind of real estate industry. Um, neighborhoods in which people can meet their needs and can have a complete community and can feel a stake and can be secure in that stake. We want that for everyone. Securing that for communities that suffered the effects of redlining requires a different set of strategies than securing that for places where there is already a lot of individual private wealth concentrated. Um, each one of these tools could be the subject of an hour long talk. Um, so I'm not gonna give them the justice they deserve, but I'm gonna sort of outline how a local reparations agenda could be structured. I say agenda as opposed to program because I do not think that this is viable to think of as one program. You know, you're not gonna have a place where it's like the city council passed reparations. Um, I think what you're gonna have is for this to be successful, reparations needs to be a guiding principle that is embedded into local policy around land use and development in a bunch of different ways. That's the only way it's gonna work. Um, and there's a mirror image of that in the fact that systemic racism was a guiding principle, whether explicit or not, that was embedded into local policy for decades. Um, so we'll kind of run through these tools um, and I'll outline ways that cities could think about tackling this reparations question. Um, vacancy for, for many, many US cities that have experienced the kind of hollowing out that both Kansas City and St. Louis and a number of smaller cities have experienced, vacancy is an obvious place to start. Um, you can look at this map. It's a little bit hard to see depending on how well my slides are coming through, but the, the brown dots here re represent vacant lots in Kansas City. And you can see that they are overwhelmingly concentrated in the redlined areas. Um, on the Kansas side, you have north of the river. And then on the Missouri side, you have east of the Troost divide. Um, these are sort of the, the, the raw material for incremental development. Um, and what can we do with that as our starting point? Well, 
first, let's understand what we're dealing with here. Um, Urban Three, as part of their case study, found um, that in a single neighborhood, which in this case was actually in Kansas City, Kansas. I know I'm talking to Missourians. I know Kansas is not Missouri. I get it. This is where we have the case study. The Bryant Elementary neighborhood has 732 vacant lots. And if you simply do a little bit of math, you know, this is not even college level math. This is this is arithmetic. If you imagine those vacant lots were developed at the average value per acre of the rest of that neighborhood, which is really, really low compared to the region, as we already saw in those redlined areas, you're looking at $30 million in wealth that is missing as a result of policies that discourage the development of this neighborhood, that encourage those lots to become vacant and remain vacant. That is one neighborhood. Multiply that across a region. We're talking about a massive amount of missing wealth of squandered potential. And a lot of these lots are in public ownership or could be acquired into public ownership. So what can we do with them? Well, land banks, for one thing, have broad discretion to choose how they are going to dispose of their, their surplus property, the property that comes into their ownership. You don't have to sell them to the highest bidder. Um, and we see different you know, examples of how that works around the country. There are a lot of cities where they do sell to the highest bidder and land bank lots tend to be bought up by, by land speculators. Um, you don't have to do it that way. There's a program in Atlanta right now where the land bank is partnering with local, um, well, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with a couple of local community land trusts to specifically secure sites for affordable housing near areas that are expected to see a lot of redevelopment that are expected to be under gentrification pressure. Um, one way you could structure a reparations program is you got a set of criteria for who qualifies to essentially receive a free lot and receive the initial financial support needed to secure credit to develop it. Um, you can also do, I didn't, um, <clears throat> I don't have a slide on this one. There's there are a few examples around the country of programs like this. I know of one in Detroit. Um, in Detroit, there is a program right now that will allow um, tenants living in homes undergoing tax foreclosure to essentially have first right of refusal to buy that home and have some financial assistance to buy the home. And they're working on scaling that up. But again, where you have these kinds of levels of disinvestment, um, the public policy priority rather than collect the back taxes or get it off the, um, you know, the get it sold, get it off the public balance sheet. The public policy priority can and should switch to get people in the community owning these lots, invested in these lots, living in these homes, owning these homes. Um, it's an important source of stability. To do that, we need financial assistance and it needs to be targeted. Um, we can do grants, we can do low and zero interest loans. Um, again, there's a nexus here. The, the specific mechanism of redlining was denying these communities access to credit. The mechanism of reparations here is providing preferential, tipping, you know, putting the thumb on the scale appropriately to provide access to credit. Um, local government, in some cases, there's a program in South Bend, and I'm going to talk more about South Bend, Indiana, a little later, but there's a program there under discussion that would essentially buy down the interest rate um, on the construction loan for small developers um, to make it feasible with far less, you know, upfront capital to redevelop a vacant lot to renovate an old home. Um, reorient public investment. Um, in addition to promoting private investment within these communities, we need to treat public investment in a very different way than we historically have in our communities. And that needs to be systematic and deliberate. Um, at Strong Towns, we talk a lot about this in our other work. The, the core principle for public investment should be, and very rarely is, that you respond to how people currently use the city. Um, and you look at where they have a need that is very clearly not being met. Um, the problem is that a lot of those needs are small. They're things like, as you see in these photos, a missing sidewalk where there should obviously be one. There is a lot of under the surface neglect going on in our public realm. And this tends to be overwhelmingly concentrated in neighborhoods that suffered redlining as well. Um, 
sometimes through outright malice, but often through um, just a misalignment of priorities and of feedback mechanisms. You know, people in wealthy neighborhoods, people with time on their hands, people with access to the political machinery are the squeaky wheel. They get the improvements they want. They get that sidewalk built. They get that playground repaired. Um, even cities that walk some of their progressive talk, most cities are struggling miserably at countering this problem. And part of it is that the way we do public investment is very much driven by looking up the government food chain to, can we get a grant from the state? Can we get a grant from the federal government, from the DOT, um, to do some big project? You know, I, in the city where I live, which is Sarasota, Florida, um, I have watched neighborhood association presidents beg elected officials for a crosswalk at a dangerous street crossing in their neighborhood as a personal favor. Hey, can I really, can I get my crosswalk this year? Come on, you know, like, um, meanwhile, the state DOT will spend $80 million on a freeway interchange to speed up the commute of suburban commuters. We are still doing this all over the continent every day. This is systematic disinvestment in some communities for the benefit of others. So a city that is serious about reparations is going to incorporate public investment into that agenda. And one way you can do that is to reorient toward the ground up rather than the grant down. You know, humbly observe where people in the community are already struggling. Where is something about the public realm failing to serve them? I say observe rather than survey or ask or listen, because we know that public engagement processes tend to favor those who have more political capital, more financial capital, more access to the machinery. Um, we need to make a point of observing rather than waiting for people to tell us. Um, city planners should be out walking the neighborhoods um, that they are, they are responsible for and they should be seeing where are people struggling? Where do we need to invest? Where do we need to repair something? We need to obsess over basic maintenance. Ask what is the smallest thing we can do to address the struggles that people are having and then do it. Don't do a study. Don't spend two years um, coming up with a master plan. Just do the little things and learn to be nimble. And this is a radical departure from how local government operates. Um, but in conjunction with private reinvestment in disinvested neighborhoods, it yields returns. One of my favorite examples of this comes out of Memphis, Tennessee. Um, the Broad Avenue District in Memphis um, fell onto really hard times after an elevated expressway was built a couple blocks away parallel, which is a very typical story. Um, by the, the mid 2000s, this historic commercial neighborhood had a lot of, a lot of blight, a lot of vacant storefronts. Um, nearby residents and business owners alike were kind of fed up. And what they did in this case in Broad Avenue was they brought in um, a nonprofit organization called Better Block, um, which is based out of Dallas, Texas. And what Better Block does is they will go, they'll go to a block, they'll go to a neighborhood where they have buy-in from residents, from business owners um, to do sort of a weekend long pop-up demonstration where they spruce things up. In this case, you can see local volunteers painting a bike lane. They add little planter boxes, they add public art, they add seating areas. Um, they create sort of a temporary demonstration of what could this place be if the public realm were invested in and if people cared about it and made this a place where you wanna be instead of a place where you wanna drive through. Um, in this case, the Better Broad demonstration project was so successful that immediately the neighbors went to the city and said, hey, can we make some of these changes permanent? And the city of Memphis agreed. Um, and it set off a bunch of cascading changes where 10 years later, you have 29 new property builds or renovations in this district. You have a 50% increase in commercial rents. Um, you have 25 new local businesses, over $15 million in new investment. Um, catalyzed simply by a bunch of neighbors getting together and saying, let's make this place look like somebody cared about it. I'm being a little bit facetious there, but the catalysts for these things are small. Um, one case study I wanted to make sure to mention, um, and I, I, I failed to mention it earlier, but um, there's a program in Oswego, New York, which is a small city on the shore of Lake Ontario, kind of post-industrial, um, has been economically depressed for a number of decades. And um, a nonprofit in Oswego launched a program called 
the Oswego Renaissance Association. Um, there's a fellow, Paul Stewart was the, the impetus for this and we've interviewed him on our podcast and he is brilliant. Um, and the gist of the Oswego Renaissance Association is very simple. Um, these are free grants available to homeowners on a block to do, to make improvements to their property, to, to fix up a facade, a porch, a roof. Um, but the catch is that you need a critical mass of people to agree to do it. Um, the grants won't simply be given to individuals. They will be given to a block that applies with buy-in from a certain share of the owners. The reason for that is that the currency that is maybe more important than money in a disinvested neighborhood is confidence. It is a mutual agreement among a critical mass of people to say, we love this place and we're not going to abandon this place and we believe this place has a future that is better than the present. And when you have that, and when it's backed up with real resources, things start to happen in a virtuous cycle. Tax incentives are another tool that cities can consider um, in terms of a reparations agenda, in terms of an agenda of systematically shifting investment into disinvested areas. Um, this would be basically the opposite of what the state of Missouri does now. Uh, Missouri is nationally infamous for abuses of tax incentives and specifically the tax increment financing process. Um, in the case of Kansas City, you can see these are these are basically the three types of tax incentives that Kansas City offers. And everything other than land bank properties um, overwhelmingly concentrated in downtown midtown in areas that were not redlined and in areas that are quite prosperous. Um, we are, do we generally use tax incentives to concentrate more resources in the hands of the biggest real estate developers um, to do big top-down projects. There is nothing saying we have to do that. Um, tax increment financing can be a tool for good in neighborhoods where you're trying to kickstart a virtuous cycle of incremental redevelopment. Why not say, okay, within this area, we got a bunch of small-scale developers working to renovate properties, to build on vacant lots, to build new commercial space for local businesses. And we are going to make sure that all of the, the new property tax revenue generated from that activity gets funneled back into improvements in this neighborhood. That would be a really transformative policy for some measure of, of justice for these places. Um, zoning and regulatory changes. One of the barriers to incremental development is that it is functionally illegal in most of the North American landscape. Um, in most cases, neighborhoods are not allowed to develop to the next increment in the ways that are actually accessible to someone in a neighborhood that isn't, um, that isn't resoundingly wealthy already to someone who doesn't have a huge amount of capital up front to do a big project. Um, we need to be allowing the next increment of development by right in our cities. By right means without going through a whole discretionary approval process, long delays, big public hearing. Um, you should be able, if you wanna build a backyard accessory dwelling unit, like this one that I actually lived in here in Florida, um, behind an existing house. You should be able to pretty quickly get your permit and go do that. If you want to turn a single family house into a duplex or a triplex or, or build one of those in a single family neighborhood, you should be able to do that really easily. Um, neighborhood level commercial spaces. Um, this does not mean loosening the reins for any sort of development. The next increment piece is important. And what's important is that you do that broadly over a large area. When you start messing with zoning in a really small area, when you say, okay, this neighborhood, we're gonna target this neighborhood for redevelopment, you set off a speculative feeding frenzy and you get the big deep pocketed developers in who are gonna outbid anyone else, anyone local who wants to do anything. The idea behind incremental development and only to the next increment is we wanna protect neighborhoods from the large scale cataclysmic money, but we wanna encourage the kinds of adaptations that are actually viable in a place that doesn't have sky high land values and sky high real estate demand already. I could talk for a whole hour about what that means. I don't have that hour, unfortunately. It is a complex question and I'm not gonna pretend it isn't. Um, I guess what I do wanna say here is 
again, in response to development getting a bad rap, um, zoning changes are a major topic of discussion and contention kind of around the country right now, specifically the idea of up zoning areas or ending single family zoning. You've got, you know, the the rise of like the yes in my backyard, the YIMBY movement. And there's a whole lot of controversy over those, over the politics of that. And without kind of oversimplifying it, what I will say is communities that have been historically marginalized, historically disinvested, have a lot of reasons to be suspicious of development. But there is a line of thinking that says, we don't want gentrification. Gentrification is what's gonna come from development. So go up zone the wealthy neighborhoods, make more room for luxury housing over there, don't mess with our zoning. Well, that's not an answer either, because when you look at that disparity, well, this is the worst way to get back to this slide, um, but it is the way I have. When you look at the disparity in the concentration of value of real estate wealth between redlined neighborhoods and neighborhoods that were never redlined, you are not gonna redress that disparity by saying, Let's literally do something, you know, add more zone capacity that is going to create more real estate wealth in already wealthy neighborhoods. Um, and let's deny that opportunity to poor neighborhoods, to neighborhoods of color. We, that, that's not an answer in my mind. We need to be thinking about development in areas that have been hollowed out, that have been disinvested, that have been um, stunted in their development pattern. But we need to be thinking equally about how to do it in a way where the benefits will accrue to the community that is rooted there. Um, the last thing, and I'm watching my time here, but I really want to make sure that I get to this last example because I find it really, really inspiring and really, really important. I want everyone to know about this. What does it take to foster an ecosystem of incremental developers? It's not enough to like create some incentives, some grant programs. You need the people in your community who will do this work. Um, South Bend, Indiana is easily the trailblazer nationwide on this front. Um, they are doing amazing stuff there and I wanna talk about it. Um, the city, a few years ago, working with um, a nonprofit called the Incremental Development Alliance, which runs a bunch of workshops, training programs, um, networking programs to try to teach people the ropes of being a small scale developer. Um, the Incremental Development Alliance came to South Bend in about 2016 um, and approached the city and said, can we, um, can we work with your, your planning staff? Can we work with your elected officials? Can we take you on a tour of some of your redlined, disinvested neighborhoods with a ton of vacancy, a ton of blight, and show you what could be done? And then let's talk about how your current codes and policies are preventing this. Um, the result has been a really remarkable effort by the city of South Bend to help foster what is an incredibly growing cohort of small scale neighborhood developers in South Bend. Um, the city has a program called Build South Bend. Um, I provided Sarah the link to that because you can read a lot more about it on their website, but they, um, um, they do workshops, they, they bring in experts, they do um, convening and networking sessions. The biggest thing that they're doing on this front is they are building an ecosystem of people, you know, a network of people who can do this work through every stage of the process. So they are making sure that if you are a black or brown person from a marginalized you know, part of South Bend and you want to become a real estate developer in your neighborhood because you have a vision for improving it, you have access to lenders who deal with the, you know, the kind of work that you wanna do. You have access to contractors. You have access to people who can teach you how to do your pro forma, how to make the project pencil. Um, you have access to people at City Hall who can help you navigate the permitting process. Um, you have a network and that network allows new people to get into doing this work. And you don't have to be as um, Mike Keene, one of the incremental developers in South Bend told me, you shouldn't have to be invited to the right Christmas party on the 20th story of a building to be able to be a developer. Um, and historically that has been the case. You have to be kind of independently wealthy or well-connected to do it. We're working on breaking down those barriers. Um, so we do, you know, we do these convening sessions where people can meet each other, where people who are curious, who maybe have gone through an entrepreneurship program at one of the local colleges, but maybe didn't initially consider real estate as the avenue for their entrepreneurship um, to branch out into that. Um, the, the Build South Bend website has a bunch of great profiles of people who have um, who are part of this cohort. Um, I'll just tell you about a couple who I've had the pleasure of speaking to. 
Um, Consuela Hopkins is working gradually over many years on a project she calls Swellasville um, in the neighborhood where she grew up on the west side of South Bend, where there was essentially no new development for 40 years. Um, and Swellasville consists right now of a new home for her tax accounting business, um, several other local businesses, and then added to that gradually, you're going to have more office space, you're going to have some commercial space and affordable housing. She's got kind of a vision over many years for building this out. Um, here's a ribbon cutting for the first kind of office stage of this project a couple of years ago. Um, Barbara Turner is a South Bend resident who founded Revive Homes LLC, um, who rehabs um, historic urban homes and sells or rents them at comparatively affordable rates for the market. Um, she is the daughter of sharecroppers from Mississippi and um, was really taken by the dream of, of home ownership for herself and then worked toward that for many years and then said, wait a minute, I can, I can give this to others. Um, but these are people who have participated in this cohort of small developers in South Bend who are networking with each other, learning from each other. Um, and the city has sought to facilitate it with things like zoning changes. They got rid of their parking minimums, which are a huge impediment to neighborhood scale infill redevelopment, having to provide off-street parking spaces. Um, this image here is from a catalog that the city of South Bend published this year of pre-approved house designs. So you can bypass having to work with an architect um, and you can bypass a lot of the, the planning approval process. If you use one of these designs, you can make certain cosmetic modifications, but you essentially get automatic approval to build one of these on a vacant lot in South Bend. Um, and they range from a single family home to, to a sixplex apartment building and a live work structure. Um, and um, I'm going to make sure I have time for questions here. So I'm not gonna talk at length about this slide. Um, what I will talk about is small development pays a return to the city. The financial case for this is as strong as the moral case. You allow this kind of infill redevelopment. You actually avoid the kinds of massive tax incentives and massive inducements that cities already habitually give to large developers to, in their view, jumpstart the redevelopment of a blighted area. And you redevelop that area in a way that is more equitable um, for the community that is already there. Um, the most important thing that I wanna share about the small development cohort in South Bend, there, there are about a hundred people doing small scale infill in South Bend right now. Almost all of them are working in the historically redlined and disinvested part of the city, not the part that is booming with large scale redevelopment. The majority of them are women and people of color and collectively they are the largest developer in South Bend. So that's the other thing, this scales. This isn't just a sideshow in terms of how we develop and create real estate and create wealth in our cities. This can scale, but it only scales when you cultivate the ecosystem of people who can learn from each other how to do it. Um, I do have to do my quick shout out for, for Strong Towns. Um, strongtowns.org is our website. We publish about a dozen articles a week. We have three podcasts. We have online video courses, um, a Facebook group that's very active. Um, and we have two, two books written by my um, friend and colleague, Charles Marone. Um, so I'm not gonna belabor the plug here, but there's um, a lot more to our organization that hasn't really been the focus of my talk today. Um, and that is all I have. Awesome, Daniel, thank you so much. Um, we do not have a lot of questions in the chat box, which works out since it's 1258. We're gonna send people on their way in two minutes <laughs> anyway. Um, I did want to um, just share that I put our forum evaluation in the chat box. We certainly would appreciate it in these last two minutes if you would spend um, some time uh, answering those questions and helping us to plan these uh, better in the future. We also have a link for our um, Empower Missouri 2022 Anti-Poverty Advocate Summit, which is just in 10-ish days somehow. Um, so we would love to have you join us if you are not already registered um, as well. Daniel, before we go, I, I do want to say we've been having some of our staff in the kind of background have been talking a little bit about um, community land banks and how the, that ties into this idea. And I was wondering if in our last couple of minutes, as folks I'm sure might have to leave, if you could just like expand a little bit on what that could look like. Um, 
yeah, I think um, I think it can be a relevant tool in a lot of places. Now, you you said community land bank, and I think um, there um, there are land banks which tend to be public entities um, and have have certain legal powers, and then there are community land trusts um, which tend to be nonprofits. So I'm not sure kind of which you were referring to in this case. Yeah, we're we're. Yeah, so we're mostly looking at community land trusts, but certainly um, in Missouri, we need that land bank to be able to clear those properties. Um, and so we're trying to make sure in communities that don't have a process already um, that we do our due diligence to make sure that they're set up as well as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the land trust model is one that really excites me. I think it's especially relevant in areas that do find themselves at risk of gentrification or at risk of that kind of larger scale speculative activity already coming in um, because the land trust is essentially a protective mechanism. Um, it allows you to get land in a vulnerable community out of the speculative market. And typically then the way it will operate is, um, um, you know, you can, um, the land trust retains the ground title. They retain ownership of the land and local, you know, homeowners, or in some cases there, there are um, commercial land trusts as well. So local businesses um, can, can buy the real estate that is owned by the land trust without buying the ground lease. So they are not getting the full appreciation of that land value. They're not, you know, going to buy the property as an investment property and sell it and reap a one-time windfall. But in exchange, it, um, you can maintain the affordability of that property for much, much longer than might otherwise be the case. Um, so I know I mentioned Atlanta. Atlanta is really like undergoing just incredible levels of gentrification in some of its historically black neighborhoods. And there you have a partnership between the land bank, which is a public entity that acquires and tries to sort of clear the title to vacant or blighted properties or tax foreclosed properties. And then they are partnering with the land trust to get those properties into nonprofit ownership to secure some affordability in neighborhoods that are otherwise rapidly becoming unaffordable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're excited about those possibilities here in Missouri. Daniel, thank you so much for your time. Uh, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am gonna stop our recording and then send you out. <laughs>